Hello, good evening. This is the SFPDASC. We are an affiliate program of the West Coast Chapter Parenteral Drug Association, connecting people, science, and regulation. This is uh, podcast number nine of our weekly podcast titled Three Websites That You Should Have in Your Favorites. These are websites that work for starting out in some background information about the PDA. As usual, this is with Nick Cap, SFPDASC Academic Advisor. Special guests include the PDA website, the WCC PDA ASC website, Innovate Bio website, and the Indeed website. Plus, as always, we have a live audience here who may chime in at any time. What we intend to do is to inform and educate a new generation of pharma manufacturers through a discussion of helpful links, stories, and interviews. Help us help you. In the coming weeks, we will be trying out various ways to inform our listeners to what it takes to work in the pharma manufacturing sphere. So you can email me always at cap at smccd.edu. So I want to try and do something different for this web class. In this podcast, we're going to take a look at three websites that you should have on your favorites. Again, I want you to join the PDA, and we're going to be looking at the SFPDA ASC. I want you to look at what we call the Innovate Bio website, which is this uh, link down here. And then we're going to look at Indeed. Before I go on there, if we had sponsors, it would look at a page very much like this. And so did you know that September 23rd or September 22nd, I, know, I don't know, is Temperature Control Day? And so the fall equinox is on September 22nd this year. And that means that the nights are equal to the lengths in day. And so what's happening is we are going from the fall to the winter. And so uh, things that you need to do is to get a fall drink. And so get some cider, go to Starbucks and get your uh, pumpkin latte. It's pumpkin latte or it's pumpkin spice, anything uh, the, this coming season. You want to check your home heating system, and that's an OQ, an operational qualification that you want to do. And then lastly, shop for your fall, um, fall fashions. So again, if we had a sponsor, this is where I'd put that information. So uh, again, what you should have on your favorites uh, when, you're, when you're looking at websites is basically indeed.com. And so when I click on indeed.com, I'm kind of registered for this. And it's a way of looking at jobs that are in the Bay Area, in my area. And so if we take a look at these jobs, we see there's a lot of jobs out there in quality control and in biotech and in FDA compliance. If you believe this indeed, FDA compliance, there's 12,000 new jobs. I don't think that's just in the Bay Area. I think that's all over, but as you can see, there's lots of jobs there. And so individuals who are, who are members of the uh, PDA, one of the things that we do talk about is that kind of FDA compliance. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Again, what I like about the um, uh, Indeed is it gives you some suggested research. It also evaluates what your potential uh, employers would be. So again, pull this up and take a look at Indeed. Now the PDA uh, as a group is over 70 years old. And so the PDA played an influential role in many of the most important advances in the manufacturing and the control of the parenteral products over, in, over the last 70 years. So again, it's been a big deal. In the 1970s, they introduced a standard methods for steam sterilization. That is, how, how do we get rid of contaminating microbes or, or, uh, that, that, are in a, uh, that, that are in a material? And this is due to a technical port, uh, report number one, which was done in 1989. The PDA is over 70 years old now. And the uh, PDA played an influential role in many of the important advances in the manufacturing and control of parenteral products over the last 70 years. Okay, so they've been a big deal on it. In the 1970s, they introduced standard, uh, standardized methods for steam sterilization techniques with the publication of the technical report number one in 1979. Since then, there have been over 80 additional technical reports published at, at, uh, by the PDA. Uh, they have a full-scale clean room for use of hands-on on training. The PDA remains a leader in sterilization, aseptic processing science, and many other areas of the pharmaceutical manufacturing and, and control. And so what's parenteral drugs? And so, uh, Parenteral drugs are uh, sterile preparations containing one or more active ingredients that are intended to be administered to a patient uh, in an area other than the elementary canal or salve on the skin. And so for the most part, they are injected underneath, uh, underneath the skin. They can either go into the muscle or the fat or a number of these other different routes. That gives us some special necessities because they are going directly into the body. And if any of you have taken an immunology class, 
you know that your skin is there to protect you from um, uh, invading microorganisms. So anything that goes past the skin has to, must, has to be sterile, be pyrogen free. And so a pyrogen is basically a chemical that's gonna cause a fever. Uh, it's usually the lipopolysaccharide from E. coli. It has to be free from particulate matter. Uh, it should be clear. It should have stability. We don't want to worry about this thing kind of degrading or forming some, some other structures when we bring it out. And it should be uh, have um, kind of human isotonicity. And that is uh, if you have things, if you just injected water or if you injected a, a very strong sugar uh, solution or, or concentrated sugar solution, that would cause some pain in there. So it's very critical that those be adjusted to what is in human beings. So the solvents and vesicles must meet special purity and other standards. Uh, you have restrictions on buffers, stabilizers, and antimicrobial preservatives, and definitely you don't want any coloring agents. It must be prepared under aseptic conditions, and so that's one of the very critical things uh, of that. Also, these drugs tend to have very uh, specific and high quality packaging requirements. And so when we talk about a parenteros, we have small volume parenteros, which are uh, basically anywhere from less than one mil to about 500 mils. And these are injected all, all at once. And these include things like furosemide. You may have all heard about heparin, uh, iron, dextran, et cetera. Some of the large volume parentals are where basically anything above 500 mils. And so these are injected or these are uh, put in over a long uh, rate of time. These include infusion fluids, uh, total parenteral nutritional solutions, so again, if you have a patient who can't eat, you can feed them through, uh, through a tube, dialysis fluid, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of these, but any of these that go in underneath the skin have certain characteristics. And so what kind of forms do we have in that drug? Uh, again, you're gonna have a sterile solution. So here's something like an IV bag. If you look at it, this has a blue dye in it. We would not be able to definitely uh, use, use that. Uh, Prepackaged syringe is a big one now. And so what we're doing is uh, what a lot of companies are doing is they are prepackaging uh, the material to be injected uh, directly into syringes at the factory. And so when the, uh, when the doctor's office get it, they just need to kind of open up a package and they can um, set the injection. Uh, we also have Cap. vials. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's not sharing. I just realized that it's not sharing. Okay. Yeah, I only see your face and my face. I only see your face and my face. Okay. Thank you. Um, so let's do. God, I'm having troubles today. So sharing the screen. Okay. Yes. All right. So I think where we were at is this one here. Per, uh, PDA is over seven years old. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you for letting me know. So no this problem. Is take number three. <laughs> and I'll click on the presenting. Okay. So the second website that you should really look at is the PDA website, pda.org. The PDA is now over 70 years old. The PDA played an influential role in many of our most important advances in uh, manufacturing of sterile uh, materials. Uh, in the 1970s, they introduced standardized method for steam sterilization techniques with the publication of technical report number one in 1979. Since then, over 80 additional technical reports have been published. They have a full-scale clean room for use in hands-on training, relatively inexpensive for members, and they also uh, uh, remain a leader in sterilization, aseptic processing science, and many others of uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing and control. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So what is a, a parenteral drug? A parenteral drug are basically sterile preparations that are meant to be injected underneath the skin. And so I have a picture here. We have a number of needles, and it shows kind of where those drugs are going. Those drugs, because again, they are going underneath the skin and they're going directly into the systemic system of the body, need to be sterile. Because again, if you remember from your uh, immunology or your microbiology course, your skin is one of the major uh, barriers to outside infection into the body and that the inside of the body 
should be relatively um, uh, bacteria or pathogen or microorganism free. And so anything that you introduce by injecting it into there can be a very problem for the body. So that being said, any of the drugs that are prepared must be sterile. They also must be pyrogen free. So a pyrogen is basically a chemical that actually causes uh, fevers within the body. And so they're not necessarily infectious, but they will make you uh, feel sick or they may, uh, will make you give, give a fever. And so there's a number of different ways that we need to treat this material. So even though it's sterile, if it has a pyrogen, a patient will react to it. These preparations must be free from particulate matter. They must be clear. They must be stable so that you can store, uh, uh, store them and ship them and the, and the patient will take them and they're still that particular uh, item. And then they must uh, be isotonic to the human body. And again, things that are, um, uh, have lower concentration or higher concentration, the patients would be able to know that. They tend to uh, complain about it. Uh, solvents or vehicles used must meet special purity uh, and other standards. Uh, you can't just use uh, tap water for it. Uh, we have something that's called WIFI, for water for injection. It's very highly purified water. Uh, uh, the there's a restrictions on the buffers, the stabilizers, and the antimicrobial preservatives that you should use. And definitely you don't use uh, coloring agents. And so you may want your sodas to have color to look like cherry soda, but you don't want to be um, having that be delivered into your body. Uh, again, these must be prepared under aseptic conditions, and um, there's specificity for high-quality packaging. And so, uh, again, when we look into parenteros, we can have small volumes, which is anywhere between, uh, between uh, 0.1 mil and uh, 500 mils. And these include things like heparin that are being injected, kind of a, a one of. Sometimes you have large volume parenteros, which would be like your IV bags, your infusion fluids, uh, uh, total peritoneal nutrition uh, solutions. And so, again, you can feed people, uh, not necessarily through the GI tract, but by uh, having the materials go in. So when we take these parenteral drug solutions, uh, these uh, uh, sterilized solutions um, can, uh, can be packaged. And what I have here right underneath Priscilla, I, I have kind of an IV bag. If you look at this, this has a, a nice pleasant blue color. But again, when you're injecting somebody with that, you don't wanna have that dye. So this, this wouldn't be correct having that dye in there. Uh, we also see uh, prepackaged needles. And so that's one of the formulations that we tend to see a lot now because that, that prevents mistakes from occurring. So what's happening is that at the, uh, at the drug company, you are prepackaging um, needles that are, are ready to go. And so all you need to do at the doctor's office is open up a package, pull out the uh, correct in injecting needle, inject the whole thing. We also see that uh, powders um, that are reconstituted. So there's a little gift here. And so we see a powder that's being reconstituted. Uh, again, that's sterile, and what you would do is you would take some sterile water and reconstitute it to that with, with the needle. We would see powders, and then we would see lyophilized cake in order to do that as well. Uh, uh, again, the last thing I'm showing here is that vials, and so this is a classic example of what we've seen. So we have our uh, active ingredient in the vials, and that can be cracked open a single use, and you would go in there and um, uh, fill up a syringe with it. And so the Parentsneal Drug Association is a global provider of science, technology, and regulatory information. So you need to know about uh, regulation. If you're making a drug that's going to be injected, the PDA is one of the groups that you should probably uh, be aware of. Uh, the purpose of the group is to create an awareness and understanding of the important issues facing the pharmaceutical and the biopharmaceutical community. They deliver high quality, relevant education to the industry. And so if you look at the PDA, actually they're, they're an education organization. They're a, a, an information sharing organization. They develop scientifically sound, practical, technical information and, uh, and, and expertise to advance pharmaceutical and biopharm bio, um, biopharmaceutical manufacturing science and regulation. And so while it's not a college or a university, it's a group of professional uh, individuals who um, are sharing their information. And so you can have this information in one company, but if it's just one company, then the, we feel that the industry overall is going to suffer. By having people share their best practices, we feel that the industry overall would do better and we would better serve our patients. Now, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is what we call uh, CGMPs. And usually this is so boring that at this point, everyone's kind of falling asleep on their desk. Hey, it's COVID, you're not falling asleep on your desk, you're falling asleep on your, on your computer. And so uh, what we see is that, remember, if we look at, uh, when we looked at the Indeed website, 
uh, that that uh, the need to manufacture under CGMP, that is FDA compliance, has lots and lots been looking for lots of jobs. And so uh, again, what you may want to see is is uh, you know I would like to work in the field, I would like to make a drug, I would like to help people by making drugs. What's one of the jobs that I can do? Uh, again, looking at this FDA compliance is very important. It's not the most exciting, but it is very important. So what I want to do here is talk a little bit about uh, what GMP or good manufacturing practice is. And so I'll, I'll read you the title and uh, please don't fall asleep like you saw before. But good manufacturing practices are the practices required in order to conform to the guidelines recommended by agencies that control the authorization and licensing of the manufacture and sale of food and beverages, cosmetics, pharmaceutical projects, dietary supplements, and medical devices. These guidelines provide minimum requirements that a manufacturer must meet to assure that their products are consistently high in quality from batch to batch for their intended use. The rules that govern each industry may differ significantly. However, the main purpose of GMP is always to prevent harm from occurring to the end user. Additional tenets include ensuring that the end product is free from contamination, that it is consistent in its manufacture, and that its manufacturer has been well documented, that personnel are well trained, and that the product has been checked for quality before uh, more than just at the end of the phase. GMP is typically insured through effective use of a quality management system, a QMS. Okay. So again, why do we practice uh, uh, GMP, or these, these good manufacturing? And again, if we look at it here, and this chart over here is uh, anywhere from scientists to food manufacturing, you're gonna need to do these uh, GMT processes. If we look at good manufacturing, we can see there's quality management involved. Uh, we need to ma make sure that we have suitable factories, that complaints and recalls are documented and handled right. We, we need to look at traceability, and we look, need to look at hygiene in, in their production. And so GMP refers to the current good uh, manufacturing um, uh, practice. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the regulation that's forced by, enforced by the, the FDA. And so again, why do we have this is because consumers expect that each batch of medicine uh, they will take meet quality standards so that they will be safe and effective. But believe it or not, the FDA has not really tested batches since the 1980s, and I think even before that. And if you think about it, there's, there's thousands of drug companies that are out there, and you just have the FDA, and you know it's a government-run organization, and the government wants to be leaner and leaner all the time. And so again, how do we ensure quality? What can you do to ensure quality when you're actually not going out there and testing those batches? And so again, here's a picture here. Uh, the, the FDA may used to have checked this, but they kind of don't uh, do it anymore. But the FDA is responsible for checking sure and making sure that we have quality. Again, by using CGMPs, we provide a system that assures proper design, monitoring, and control of manufacturing processes and facilities. And it ensures the identity, the strength, the quality, and the purity of these drugs. In order to achieve CGMP, you will need to establish a very strong quality management system, attain appropriate quality raw materials, establish robust operating procedures, uh, detect and investigate product quality deviations. And so what we see is CGMP is not law. Uh, CGMP is not testing, but the CNGMP requirements are established to be flexible. So if you have a law, you absolutely have to do things to the letter of the law. But with CGMP, what you say is you, the law is you must follow CGMP. However, the CGMPs, each manufacturer, that is your company, decides individually how to best implement the necessarily controls by using scientifically sound design, processing methods, and testing procedures. The C in CGMP stands for current, requiring companies to use technologies and systems that are up to date in order to comply with the regulations. How do they find these uh, current uh, requirements? Is they go to the uh, PDA. And so again, the, uh, what I'm saying here is the FDA's expectations, how, do we, how are we supposed to know? How's, how's a brand new company supposed to know uh, what the expectations are from the FDA? So the FDA publishes regulations and guidance documents for industry in the Federal Register. You can go to the FDA website, it's www.fda.gov. This also contains links to CGMP regulations, to guidance documents, to various resources to help drug companies uh, comply with the law. The FDA also conducts extensive public outreach by presenting to professional groups like the PDA or the ASQ or the ISPE. And, and lastly, you can consult, use consultants like me 
uh, to go in there and help your company um, figure out how to use CGMP in order to manufacture your documents. The last thing that I'd like you to, um, a website that I'd like you to know, especially if you are a beginning practitioner of biotechnology and biomanufacturing, is the National Center for Biotech Education. Um, this is a center that's called Innovate Bio. And like the PDA, they are an educational group. But again, they're a little bit uh, kind of lower down the line. I think PDA is a little bit more towards regulation. The biotech is basically looking at how to train people to do procedures and to work in a lab and work in a manufacturing environment. And so uh, the National Center for Biotech and, uh, Education, or this Innovate Bio, has links to centers that offer you a certificate or degree in your area. So you can, they're a national center, you can look them up and you can find hopefully a community college or another area down the street from you in the area that you live that can help you um, uh, gain the knowledge and skills to get a job in biotech. They also have, again, in times of COVID, they have talks and get togethers that usually are free. Uh, they, they carry car career information and more blogs. So like this blog, they'll carry more blo blogs. They are funded by an NSF ATE grant. And so uh, they, are, they have, um, federal help behind you. Well, those are three websites that I think you should have, the, um, uh, the Indeed, the PDA.org, and the uh, Innovate Bio. So this has been Cap Vlogs. Thank you for tuning in. See you later.